All right, so today we're going to talk about transformational learning experiences online. Um, a lot of us obviously have uh, have this uh, idea that, oh, online experiences are far less interesting and effective than in-person experiences. And obviously, you can't replace the in-person. However, uh, the, the person I'm talking with today, Lorenz Sell, uh, he's created a platform called Sutra, which we'll talk about later, that allows, uh, and not just the, the platform, but, but Lorenz, what you teach uh, helps people to, to bring more of the transformational aspect that they might only expect on, you know, in person into the online environment. So really excited to, to, to have you here. Lorenz, thank you so much. Thanks, George. It's really great to be here. Yeah. So let me um, just kind of like share your official bio with folks, and then we'll get into this conversation about creating transformational online learning experiences. So um, Lorenz, you are the co-founder of Sutra.co, and uh, I just want to first uh, bring it up on, on the screen because I think it's good for people to, to kind of see it. Um, and if I could spell it correctly, I will bring it up on the screen. So um, yeah, I just want to show people. So Sutra, Sutra.co. Um, and by the way, it's not sutra.com, right? It's sutra.co. Sorry, right, oh, .co. C -O. Yeah, yeah, .co, yeah. And uh, this is really, as you can see, it's built for people who are kind of like wisdom creators or wisdom communicators, people creating uh, in the more holistic space. It's not just any kind of, um, you know, just another online course platform. No, it's very much about like, you know, transformational experiences. So... Uh, back to back to your background here. So the platform uh, has supported programs at the Harvard Program in Refugee Trauma, and the United Nations, and the Presence Institute. So some really um, you know respect, respected organizations that that is using Sutra. Um, this platform now has over twenty four thousand people participating in group learning experiences. Amazing, and you and your partner have also created an online mentorship program, a seven-week program called Transformational Teaching Online, uh, which has helped hundreds of educators to create more meaningful connection, deep conversations for their online experiences. So anyway, we're going to talk more about that, but let's dive right into this. Um, what, how, do you, how do you think about online learning experiences that, that's different from what most of us have experienced with online courses? Yeah, and, and I think you kind of you used the word there that really jumped out at me, which is meaningful. You know, a lot of yes. my um, yes. journey with this work started with um, really an aspiration towards meaningful work, towards creating more love and connection into the world. And, and really the last 10 years has been about what does that mean? What does that look like in practice and in a practical way, particularly online? And um, where that's really landed is just really seeing how an online learning experience can be a vehicle that invites uh, particular ways of being together, that invites qualities of, of deep listening, of empathy, of presence, of really um, witnessing each other and um, seeing each other at a very deep level. So, so obviously I'm talking about a, a group experience. And, and I think it's important to know that when it comes to online learning, there's a broad spectrum of, of what that can mean, right? On, on one side of the spectrum you have um, and a, a kind of experience where you put up some content and then a person goes through it at their own pace, what's called an evergreen self-paced experience. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have an experience where there's an emphasis on the communication and connection between the participants. So more of like a group experience. And then, and then in between you have something where you have a course and you know, maybe you have content, you might have a Facebook group and people can post messages and there's activity, but there isn't necessarily an emphasis on um, the quality of relationship and intimacy between the participants. And, and none of these are necessarily better or worse than, than uh, each other. Um, they're just, they're different. And I think it's really important to understand the, the differences and also the possibility that if you are a heart-centered creator and educator um, who really thrives from meaning, right? I think it's really important to understand also what's what's important to you because for some people it's it's um, that creating that kind of connection isn't isn't an important. They have they have information they want to share and that's what they care about. But for other people, um, that 
sense of I'm having a transformational impact on people. I'm creating a space of deep connection, of transformation. Um, and that's really meaningful to me and the people who I'm working with. That's, that's really meaningful. Um, and so I think what's, what's important to understand is that that's absolutely possible it, online. It's obviously possible in person, but it's absolutely possible online. And that's, and that's really been the heart of our work is um, both really um, discovering that possibility, like, you know, what, what is possible online and, and then creating best practices and software uh, to, to support these kinds of experiences. That's awesome. And uh, a couple of questions about this. Do, is there a ideal number or range of number of people uh, that you recommend so that the experience can feel more intimate or meaning, the connection can feel more meaningful? Or is, is, there, is, there, is there not a number if it can be, uh, I mean, we, we could talk about whether there is a maximum or minimum number for a group uh, or maybe maybe it doesn't really matter how large a group is, but it's about the breakout groups or the smaller groups that are formed you know, within the larger container. What do you think about that? Yeah, exactly. And and I and you know one of the insights that we had was that meaningful connection really happens in small groups. That it's you know it's really hard to feel connected to a group of a hundred people or a thousand people, say in a Facebook group. But um, but when you are in a group of say five to ten people. And there's a particular um, structure that invites your interaction, that invites a space of deeper intimacy and sharing, then there's an opportunity for a deeper connection. But if you have a larger community, so for example, a lot of this work for me started when um, around 2015, I participated in a program from the Presencing Institute, uh, which is an organization loosely affiliated with MIT. Uh, and they had 30,000 people in there in, in an offering that they had online. And they put us into groups of five people. And so over, over the course of 10 weeks, um, I, I would meet once a week with these people. And I felt a, it was one of the first times when I felt a very deep level of connection with strangers online. And, and so this really crystallized this idea for me that the way that people feel connected is through small groups. But when you're in a small group in the context of a larger group and you feel connected to that small group, you can also feel connected to that larger group. So, so you know, however big your population is, and I think this is this is also a really key um, area where something like prototyping really uh, helps because you can start with a however big a population you ultimately want to address. Um, if if your goal is connection, you you can start with a small group because you're you're really talking about something that's alive. Something connection happens when people are authentic, when they're present, when they feel safe. Um, so these are, these are qualities that are alive. They're not necessarily formulaic. They're going to be different with every community, with every body of knowledge. And um, when you approach that as a, as a prototype, when you're really kind of approaching it from a space of, okay, I actually don't know how to do this. Um, and, and I'll just say, you know, I've been doing this uh, pretty much nonstop for 10 years. And, and I still come back all the time to, I actually don't know how to do this. Um, but in, in a way that really opens up a space of curiosity and, and, and learning and even knowing that every time I work with a group, even if it's in, in, in the community of, um, of people that I've worked with before, that, that group is different. That group is alive. That group is, there's something new that's emerging there. There's something new to learn. So really taking this approach of starting with a small group, prototyping, trying different things, really continuously learning about what, what works. And, and then also possibly scaling that. So if, if something works with uh, a group of five to 10 people and you have a, a larger community of a hundred or a thousand, then you can really look at gradually expanding that in a way that's organic, in a way that's authentic, and in a way that's really informed by um, the real world behavior and experience of your participants. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, in the experiences you've had, whether it is as a participant or as a facilitator, uh, have, there, have you noticed any patterns in terms of common pitfalls um, that make the experience or that break the intimacy or break the, the meaningful uh, connection? Is there any kind of like 
<laughs> things that we should watch out for you know like don't you know don't, don't do this <laughs> or, you know maybe even though there uh yeah i agree with you there, there's no like formula for every group uh of every industry uh there probably are some uh some pitfalls that, that you've noticed have you anything you want to share in regards to that yeah it's an interesting question as far as pitfalls you know one of the challenges with with doing this kind of um you know what i what i call like transformational experience design is that ultimately you're creating a space that invites a deep quality of authenticity and and with that authenticity uh things can come up and you know sometimes uh that can create <coughs> excuse me a, a disruption in in the space you know something can get activated in in people and and so you know i think ultimately if you are creating a transformational space online, there's a whole um, slew of things to be aware of in, in the way that the space is uh, defined and, and contained. You know, in person, you have people's undivided attention for, you know, a whole day. Um, there's a lot less distractions. You can have a lot more control. Um, online, there's a lot more variables. And I think this is also where prototyping really helps you gradually begin to become aware of the different variables that can affect your experience. This is this is going to be different for, you know, everybody, depending on the depth that you want to take it to, depending on what's appropriate if you're working in um, a corporate environment versus if you're working with a group of seasoned awareness-based practitioners. Obviously, these are, you know, there's a very broad spectrum of how people might respond to different levels of authenticity. And, and also in an online environment, when things come up, how that's handled, you know, particularly right now, for example, um, there's a lot of work being done in the anti-racism space. And so that's a space where um, it's really easy to step into a very sensitive territory to have something potentially explosive come up. And how, how do you respond to that? How do you handle that in an online space? Um, there aren't necessarily clear answers for that other, other than for you as the space holder to really approach everything as a, as a learning experience, as, as a prototype that you continually learn from, and also um, invite your own authenticity in, in really sharing with people that, that, you're, that you're learning, that your goal is to create a space of deep um, connection and, and authenticity. I think one of, the, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that the more clearly you can define what's ahead, the, the more uh, likely you will avoid challenges. And so if you're, for example, if you're going into a sensitive topic area, just saying, we're about to go into a sensitive topic area. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Um, or even a simple, for example, if you're organizing an experience where you, um, you're, you're organizing an online course where you plan to have a series of Zoom calls, um, being very clear on the schedule of those Zoom calls before people sign up, being very clear on the expectation of attendance, because you might have your experience and say, well, no one's showing up for my Zoom calls or no one's doing this. Uh, so the more that that expectation of participation can be made absolutely clear beforehand, the more that anything that might come up might can be spoken to beforehand, the more that people really have a choice and you kind of ask their permission along the way um, the more the space becomes safer and can really sustain a deeper level of uh, connection and interaction. Mm, awesome. And uh, you've spoken about <clears throat> this idea of prototyping several times, and I wonder if you could go into it a little bit. Like, um, I agree with you, you know, as, as an uh, entrepreneurially minded person, I always think that experimentation is, is everything, you know, and how we learn. And, uh, you, you know, you, we share that same mindset. So when you're prototyping a group experience, what does that really mean? Like, like, do you, is it a launch? Is it a big launch? Do you, uh, yeah. What, what, what is a big, you know, like, is this <laughs> kind of like, give us that kind of contrast between what we typically might think of as I'm going to launch a group program versus I'm prototyping something. Right. And, and I think this, this is the, the thing about prototyping. And, and I'll just say that pr prototyping has really transformed my um, kind of entrepreneurial career. I, it really started with the book Lean Startup that I thought is phenomenal as far as really, um, you know, what they call minimum viable product, which is kind of a version of, of, of prototyping. But 
um, and also uh, discovering the work of the Presencing Institute. And they have something called Theory U, which is really heavily about um, looking at a space where you want to um, innovate, uh, observing that space, really sensing it, really building a very visceral personal relationship with it to allow some sort of new insight to emerge, and then crystallizing that insight into action, into some kind of prototype that allows you to really ground it and test it in reality, and then take the learning from that and repeat that process of observing, sensing, and again, crystallize it. And, and so, you know, in, in that sense, um, prototyping can mean um, kind of like what you suggested. It can mean it in a more marketing context where you put together uh, a landing page or an offer and then see how many people sign up for it. But in the, in, in the group sense, a, a prototype is, is really um, testing different approaches to how you bring the group together. You know, so you're, you're creating a container, you're offering people um, particular agreements and expectations, you're enrolling commitment. And, and then when it comes to this kind of transformational work, you're, you're doing something that I call warming up the space. And this involves a particular rhythm of uh, maybe if you're working with say a slightly larger group of you know, over 10 people doing some breakout groups, uh, offering people prompts, maybe some uh, journaling, maybe some, some stillness, different kinds of activities. And so all of these activities, all of these things that you put into that mix to warm up that space, right? Because you put a group of people together and the default response is um, people are kind of quiet, people are a little like, you know, they're a little guarded. It's natural. Even, even the most enlightened people, you put them in a room, there's, it takes a moment to kind of thaw that ice and really warm up. And, and so in, in, you know, in the work that we do when it comes to this thing called transformational experience design, it's really about how do you warm up that space? How do you create a space of, of vulnerability? How do you create a space of sharing and, and deep connection? And, and, and so the prototype is really all the different approaches to that, the different activities, the, the, the rhythm that you bring into that um, online in the context of what you do, right? Because that's also going to be different with, like, as I mentioned, different communities, different bodies of work. And so the prototype is really finding uh, the particular flavor and expression that is yours, that is appropriate for your community and the people that you're working with by working with uh, different activities and, and a different rhythm and pacing. Uh, and, it, and it can be subtle just from um, kind of, you know, from di across different Zoom calls. Uh, you know, I, I like to think that there's, there's hard metrics and there's soft metrics. There's hard metrics like I put up a landing page and this many people signed up and I did some A-B testing and this page is better than this page. But when it comes to uh, a transformational experience, we're really talking about softer metrics. Like how, how did the space feel? You know, how did the people feel? It's something you can have as a kind of a visceral experience. And, and in my experience over the last 10 years, that's the prototype is you're really, you're, you're, you're bringing a group together and you're sensing, okay, like I'm, I'm trying this and this is the response that I received and this is how it felt and, and this is how the participants felt. And, and this is how, you know, we kind of started here as a, as a felt sense and, and we ended here as a felt sense. As we went through this journey and so maybe you can't quite quantify it with, with hard numbers, but you can feel it. And, and as, you, as you get more practiced at that, um, you, you really begin to develop a sense for that. Mm. And you also um, <clears throat> teach about the gathering of the feedback, I guess, um, from from those who those the groups that you are prototyping. Mm. Um, I'm I, I'm like as my students and clients know, I'm really obsessed about feedback as well. Like I'm always looking to say, how can I improve? Uh, how can this group improve? Uh, what was that like for you? What was your favorite thing? What was one thing that you know you could uh, that you suggest to be different? But how do you think about getting feedback so that we can continue to improve the prototype? Yeah, I mean e exactly what you just said, and and I'm similarly, um, you know, such a big fan of gathering feedback in any way possible. Over the last ten years, I mean, I don't know how many surveys and uh, user interviews I've done, but a lot. And so for me, that revolves around um, if you're running a course experience, you can do a pre-course survey just to really understand your participants a little more, you know, what's your intention? Uh, what's your background? Um, you know, there, whatever questions are going to give you information that will somehow inform 
you better about who exactly are the participants in your experience. And then I always do a, a mid-course survey and the mid-course survey, again, just ask people about, uh, for example, I'll ask, um, uh, how was your experience of the Zoom calls? And they'll have five options, something like um, transformed my experience, um, you know, was, I don't remember the exact things, but was really great, uh, was okay, um, you know, kind of not so good, bad. Um, and then we always ask uh, a classic, what's called a net promoter score. You know, how likely are you to recommend this experience to another person, which is always such a powerful and telling response because if a person's likely to recommend it, they're obviously satisfied with, um, with the experience. Um, and then we always do exit surveys, you know, some kind of just questions that help us understand about the person's experience in, uh, in, in the course. I'll, you know, especially in the earlier stages of the formation of a course, uh, doing face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Like you can get that much, into so much information from a survey, but, you know, having that conversational flow of, of you know, a person says something and you kind of go off script a little bit to dive a little deeper to really understand their experience. If you're serious about creating a space that really invites this deep quality of, of connection, it, you know, really the, the trick is really getting inside the mindset of your participants about what's important to them. And, 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 and some of these things there um, you know, they're, they're tacit. You just kind of get a feel for them and, and having conversations with your participants really helps that. Um, and then the other thing I'll add, which is kind of a, a unique question that I found so powerful and it's it, your, your questions that you offered uh, a minute ago remind me of, is really asking people, you know, really trying to tap into the listening that people have for you. So, so that, that might mean something like asking them, um, what are my strengths? And what are my weaknesses? You know, really uh, giving them permission to um, to just speak directly to how they perceive you. How how can you understand? You know, if you're trying to work with a particular community, um, there's there's your skills, there's what you're good at, but then there's just the the perception that that community has of you. And sometimes uh, we we don't see that. Sometimes it, it's somehow it's blind to us. And yeah. uh, and to the extent to which you can. Uh, create an opportunity for people to speak to you directly about that so that you can become aware of that and and work with that however you need to i find that's that's one of the most mm. powerful things you can do it's a courageous thing <laughs> mm. yeah it's hard people and i to... was actually shocked uh, I, I yeah. recently uh you know was speaking with a, a whole bunch of our creators and i gave them yeah. this assignment yeah. uh of, of doing this work and i was really surprised that Almost none of them did it um, because it's, it is, it's, it's really, really hard. Yeah, it's like you have to really be uh, ready to be neutral about receiving it, not be defensive, you know, or not be too shy when someone says, these are your strengths. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you know, thank you. Uh, that's very helpful to, to understand your thinking about the, the feedback gathering. So um, I, I'd love for you to, to say a bit more about uh, the transformational teaching online did I get that right? I know it's TTO, uh, yep, Transformational, Transformational Teaching, Teaching Online, yes, um, which is an upcoming, uh, and you, you do this on an occasional basis. So whenever, yeah, whenever people year. are, okay, yeah, awesome. And so I'm just going to go to the link, tto.sutro.co, and I'm going to share the screen real quick, just to kind of people can see it. Um, there it is. Awesome. Um, Transformational Teaching Online. So do you want to just talk us through what can be expected as as people sign up for this sure and, and i'll just share briefly the backstory you know we yeah. uh, my wife and i we started sutra five years ago um, mm -hmm. really kind of out of this culmination of our search for you know how do you create mm -hmm. meaningful connection how do you bring more love uh, mm -hmm. into the world and how do you do this online and mm -hmm. and so over over the last five years we had an opportunity just to to work with a lot of different organizations a lot of different individuals really in in kind of almost like a continuous prototype and just before COVID hit uh, at the beginning of 2009, 2019, <laughs> I yeah. think so. Yeah, we're end, um, of, end of 2019, yeah. <laughs> yeah, end of 2019, yeah. yes, exactly. Um, we, we, you know, we realized that we had so much, um, we'd learned so much and that we'd really built this platform to be used in a particular way. And, and that we wanted to kind of condense everything we learned into um, into a course to share the best practices around it. So this was this was the first cohort of TTO actually launched 
just before COVID went live, and actually halfway through is is when COVID really um, came into the into the mainstream. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, it was, um, you know, is is really interesting how the work that we do now with with the TTO is so relevant to um, the the possibility of 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 uh, and the necessity of of really connecting online. Um, yeah. And so the the TTO is 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 really about how do you create an online space that invites um, deep qualities of presence, meaningful connection, deep conversation, and we take you through every aspect of um, creating the content, um, the technical setup, um, learning how to um, facilitate groups online, how to work with embodiment practices, um, but really, and I, I think this is the, the you know the most powerful part of the course is that it's not conceptual. It, it, it gives you a direct experience of what's possible. And when people come through this experience, um, they, they end up having a life-changing experience. And, and we've had some, if you go to the course page, I, I highly recommend watching the testimonials because I can't, I can't do justice to the experience. And I mean, it's life-changing for me just to be a, a participant in it because it's literally co-created by all of us. And many of the people who come, you know, some of the people who come have no, you know, have no experience with working with people online. They just have an aspiration to do this kind of work. If you scroll up a little bit, you'll see there's a bunch of video interviews. Um, oh, I think uh, they're, not, they're, they're not they're, there right now, but they're, um, they're there right now for some reason. Maybe oh, there, there you oh, go. There, there you awesome. go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, some of the people who come into the course, they have very little experience. And um, some of the people who come into the course have decades of experience working with uh, people, working with trauma, um, working as healers. Um, and so what, what happens in the course is that you get this direct experience of what's possible in a community of practice. Mm. And you come out of it with um, first this deep sense of meaningful connection uh, with your peers. Um, you come out of it really having had an experience, a direct yeah. experience yourself of what's that's, possible. I think that's what's most valuable. I mean, yes, of mm. course, the people in the TTO course learn the how-tos of creating right. this type of experience. But then the actual, the experience itself is, I think, the greatest learning. Um, it's life-changing. Therefore, they're excited to actually you know, do this uh, with, with their own community too. But thank you exactly. so much, Lorenz. Yeah. Um, obviously, those who are watching this video, the link is above or below wherever you're watching this. <laughs> um, it's tto.sutra.co. Sutra, yep. Yeah, S tto.sutra.co um, but check out the link and any questions uh, about the program you know comment below and i'll make sure lorenz sees it thank you so much lorenz for the work that you do and how you do it and just uh the impact that you're making by helping so many caring wise creators and teachers be able to make a much deeper impact online than before so thank you Thank you, George, and thank you for the work that you do. It really touches my heart. Thank you.